Dear colleagues and friends, this is Hui Kai, Head of Content Division at Wuxi Aptech. On behalf of my colleagues around the world, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the sixth episode in our rare disease webinar series, Collaborations That Transform. This May is Huntington's Disease Awareness Month. Thank you for joining us today as we raise awareness about this devastating disease and the hundreds of thousands of families around the world impacted by it. Huntington's disease, also known as HD, is a hereditary neurodegenerative disease. It deteriorates a person's physical and mental abilities and is often passed down in families from generation to generation. Unfortunately, there is no cure. Despite recent clinical setbacks, members of the HD communities of patients, families, clinicians, and drug developers are determined to break barriers to find a cure. During today's webinar, you'll hear about the challenges associated with this HD, the diverse and innovative medicines progressing in the clinic, and new modalities that may offer transformative solutions for HD patients. At Wuxi Aptech, we believe that a brighter and healthy future is only possible when every one of us work together as a community. So as we have done in the previous webinars, today we're delighted to connect you with members across the resilient HD community, the scientists, clinicians, patient advocates, because it takes a robust community to bring hope and solutions, not only for HD patients, but also for the more than 300 million people worldwide living with a rare disease. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce our friend, Mike Ward and Clarovet to kick off our first discussion. Welcome to this webinar, which coincides with Huntington's Disease Awareness Day. I'm Mike Ward, the Global Head of Life Sciences and Healthcare Thought Leadership at Clarivate, and I'm delighted to be hosting this opening fireside chat with Professor Michael Hayden, uh, who is the most cited author uh, in the field of Huntington's disease and um, uh, also has an impressive uh, track re record, both in academia and in industry. Indeed, Michael is uh, currently a Killam Professor of uh, Medical Genetics at the University of British Columbia and the Canada Research Chair in Human Genetic and uh, Molecular Medicine uh, and is the author of more than 900 publications and the recipient of many, many awards. Some of his work from his lab at UBC actually uh, led to the development of the first approved gene therapy. And in addition to his academic work, he was the president of Global R&D and the chief scientific officer at Teva Pharmaceutical Industries. Um, uh, and that was between uh, 2012 and 2017. And, and during that time, 35 uh, drugs treating CNS diseases were approved, including one for Huntington's disease. Michael also is the co-founder uh, of uh, five biotech companies and is currently the CEO of Prolinia Therapeutics, as well as being uh, a member of uh, the board for a number of private and, and, and public biotechs. So consequently, Michael is very well placed to uh, discuss both the, sort of the challenges and opportunities associated with Huntington's disease. Um, so Michael, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, Mike. It's a pleasure to be here. So, Michael, um, <clears throat> I mean, sort of, you know, kick off sort of almost like the, the big question. In your opinion, you know, how would you describe the sort of the current state of research and development for effective treatments uh, of, of Huntington's disease? Well, I would say, you know, the preclinical research is going ahead at an excellent pace. Identification of new targets and pathways, new approaches. Uh, um, but the field is still coming to terms with the disappointments that came out of the Roche and WAVE trials 
that were just again publicly announced at the CHDI conference yesterday. Um, this, uh, this result showed uh, uh, that um, patients uh, in the Roche trial who were on uh, frequent therapy every eight weeks actually did worse in progression than placebo. The patients on more infrequent treatment did the same as placebo. Uh, and in the WAVE trial, uh, again, there was disappointing news in that um, the, there was uh, no target engagement uh, and no knockdown of uh, mutant Huntington, as one might have hoped. And also there were some serious adverse events in the high dose group in, in a significant number of patients. So all of this is a shock to the community, but it's important to note that, that the mechanism proposed, which is knockdown of mutant Huntington as a potential approach to treatment of Huntington disease is still alive and well. Uh, we do not know exactly why, uh, for example, the Roche trial failed. There are still many questions that we hope to be able to get answers to, and we will learn a lot from this particular trial. Um, the questions uh, are raised uh, that are not answered yet include uh, the Roche trial knocked down both the mutant, the cause of the disease, and the wild-type Huntington disease. Did knocking down wild-type Huntington disease have a greater effect in terms of losing some of the neuroprotection that may have come from knocking down mutants? Secondly, it appears there might have been uh, an inflammatory process with white cells in the CSF, and did this inflammatory process also have some impact, uh, in particular in patients who were getting uh, uh, treated more frequently. Thirdly, this particular ASO did knock down, did not knock down exon one, and was uh, the knockdown of exon one important for this? So all of these are uh, questions that are to be answered. They will direct future therapeutic strategies. Wave has announced that they will go into another trial with another linked polymorphism, uh, but with new chemistry. Some of the preclinical data uh, uh, in vivo does offer more hope. So there's tremendous amount to be learned from those studies. This is a disappointment for the community, uh, but this is a resilient community, a community committed to the long-term. It's a marathon, and we're only partly through that marathon. And by working together, we'll learn more to design new trials that are innovative uh, in this way. And also there are numerous companies and trials behind still focusing on knockdown. And we can talk about those in a moment. Yeah, sure. I mean, it actually, it, <clears throat> I mean, notwithstanding the sort of, you know, the, sort of the disappointment uh, of, of, of those, of that trial that you, you described, you know, what have you observed or are you seeing that actually still makes you optimistic that we're going to be able to uh, come up with treatments for poor Huntington's disease in the future? Well, I'm optimistic and I'm optimistic for the long term. I think you need to let many flowers bloom. You know, uh, predicting success uh, in clinical development is always very difficult, but I'm pleased to see that many, there are many initiatives focusing on different approaches to improving Huntington disease. Some are gene therapy, where you're actually looking to uh, uh, actually knock down uh, uh, Huntington in the area where it's most important, which is the caudate nucleus, the basal ganglia. Others are oral forms of therapy, which give, will give you the target engagement that you need. Finally, there are drugs now, uh, there is a drug in late stage clinical development from Prolenia that's focusing on a totally different mechanism, an oral drug that reaches all parts of the brain and is focusing on increasing the activity of sigma-1 that has some compelling preclinical and early clinical data that gives one hope. So I would say the community, while disappointed, is resolute, determined to reach the goal. It may take a little longer, 
but the community is committed. And I would say, the com when I talk about the community, I talk about scientists, I talk about clinicians, I talk about the families, the patient organizations, all together, because we are inextricably bound. We need the patients to participate in the trials, and the patients have come forward with amazing courage, dignity, and commitment. And we need the same from the scientists and the clinicians, and I would say the community as a whole is robust, healthy, and working together. I mean, instead of looking at that point, you know, specifically, um, for those, you know, those scientists and, the, and those clinicians, what what are the sort of the biggest challenges that um, you know that, that they face, and and you know, what what are they doing to you know, address them? Well, the scientists and clinicians have worked close to the families for a long time, and I would say now, as part of clinical development the involvement of family representatives is very crucial. Working with the lay organizations, be it the European Huntington Disease Network, which, which essentially represents patients and scientists all together, the Huntington Disease Society of America, the Huntington Society of Canada, together with lay organizations throughout is very important. From a structural point of view, in terms of clinical development, we are also, most trials now are having patients as part of the steering committee, uh, family members, and also some are having uh, family advisory groups uh, that are also advising the, de the delineation of endpoints. So this working together, it's tremendously humbling and mutually learning. Uh, as scientists and clinicians, we don't always know what matters most to patients. We have learned, for example, from patients that stopping the progression of the illness, allowing them to maintain function, even for a short while, is most important. Allowing them to continue to do, continue their activities of daily living, continue working, continue managing finances, continually hugging uh, their children and grandchildren going on trips together. So maintaining function is an area that's of most concern. And this is the area that most companies are now focusing on, which is maintaining function. The good news is there's also been evolution on the regulatory side because we can't get drugs to patients. We work again in deep partnership with the regulatory authorities both in the United States, at the FDA and Europe, the EMA, and various country regulatory authorities. And they too, over the last few years, have recognized that functional, maintaining function is most important for patients. And so they've allowed, uh, for the first time for over the last few years, functional capacity or ability to main func maintain function as measured by different endpoints as a single, primary endpoint in clinical trials. They've understood the meaningfulness, significance of this particular approach. And the one measure that's used is TFC, total functional capacity. This is a measure that's been around a long time, discovered by Scholson and Fahn in the late 70s. It's been used in many clinical trials in the past, and now is a recognized endpoint for the FDA also included with EMA as a single meaningful endpoint. Sadly, there's been no drug except one that has had impact uh, on uh, TFC in any study or in any analysis. When we think about drugs for the CNS, ideally, if one had a choice, you'd like an oral drug that can have target engagement that's very soluble to get across the blood brain barrier and get to numerous parts of the brain, because in the end, Huntington disease is a diffuse brain disease. It starts selectively in the basal ganglia, but as the disease progresses, it affects most regions of the brain. And ideally, you want a drug that reaches there. Alternatively, you could uh, develop and, in, and provide a way to deliver a drug either into the ventricles or into the basal ganglia, or potentially intrathecally 
uh, that gets diffusion and gets involves the full brain, but that's more difficult and constitutes additional challenges. So I, I just like to focus a little bit more on, on, on that patient voice. You sort of mentioned, you know, how listening to, to the patient has sort of, you know, shapes or like in the development of, of, of meaningful endpoints, uh, not just sort of, you know, uh, clinical endpoints. Uh, could you sort of describe, <clears throat> you know, what it actually looks like? So, sort of, you know, at, at your company, you sort of said, you, you know, you've listened to patients. How, how does, how, how do patients interact on a sort of a day-to-day -day or a month-to-month -month basis with, you know, you and, and your colleagues? Well, you know, my history is that I first saw patients with Huntington disease more than 40 years ago in South Africa as a medical student intern. And in those days you did home visits. And so I learned to visit these patients often disenfranchised by their disease, but I was moved by the courage, the dignity, the respect and warmth. And that had a lasting impact on me and still motivates and inspires me personally. Since then, I've been deeply involved with patient organizations. There are many ways you can interact. At our lab in Vancouver, we have patient tours where they come and visit the lab and understand what we're doing. And we have opportunities. There are patient camps where you interact with patients. We founded the first Huntington disease camp really in the mid eighties in uh, Canada. And these camps are seen uh, both throughout Canada now and also throughout the world. So there are many ways that you learn. You learn that these are patients that are often disabled, but they are perceptive, they feel, they, they really have lots to offer and their courage and their commitment to do whatever is needed to hasten and improve the field is profound. Then it gets translates into more specific activities. As part of this in trials, these patient advisory groups are there first to discuss what are the endpoints that matter most to patients? And I think there's an alignment that if we could have some way to delay progression, that has the most impact for patients in terms of the quality of their lives. And so you work with a patient advisory group. And then in addition, patients on a steering committee or family members that play a key role. And it's most important that we also recognize that there are families and patients with Huntington disease not just in North America and Europe, but all over the world, in many disenfranchised countries where uh, facilities are much, much less significant, there's less support. And as part of this, we also need to think about how, when we finally get a drug approved, we can have access to these drugs globally. So patients can be afforded the benefits of participating in science and research but that those benefits are distributed uh, around the world in ways that these other countries can also benefit. So it, it is a global perspective. It's a global perspective that is significant in terms of working with families. You know, this is a serious disease. It has been described as one of the most disastrous disease. And it's disastrous because there are 100,000 patients in the world who are affected with Huntington disease, but every, for every one patient, there be, may be three people who carry the gene who are destined to be ill, but not yet ill. This is a large number of patients. And sometimes when you think about treating patients, you may need to treat, treat patients before they get a symptom. So at the moment, all the trials are focusing primarily on secondary prevention, patients who are have the disease and now you want a slow progression. But ideally in a protective way, in a thinking about neuroprotection, you'd wanna focus even earlier so you can treat patients before they've lost too many cells and hopefully maintain and stabilize their function. So it's a global issue. It's a disease that uh, has no treatment now that alters progression. And sadly, when you are burying your mother or your father, you have some insights into potentially your own future. So you, it's in perpetuity in families. 
And that's what the cycle of hope that we're trying to provide and the cycle of despair to break this, to break this cloud that threatens these families in effort to bring them hope, bring them optimism, but we do this together with them as they volunteer to participate in trials, often where outcomes are not known, uh, such as in the Roche trial, but the patients are resolute uh, and their dignity and determination commitment is very deeply inspiring for me. Yeah, uh, I mean, and it's interesting. I mean, a, an area that, um, you know, so sort of 10 years, 20 years ago was, uh, you know, sort of potentially bleak for, for a lot of patients was in the area of cancer. But in the sort of, you know, the last, certainly in the last decade with the sort of the advent of immune oncology, we've seen sort of, you know, rapid advances in the treatment of cancer. I'm just wondering whether there are any lessons from what was achieved there that can, you know, help in the sort of development treatment of, of, of diseases of the brain? Yeah, well, that's a really important question. And I would say there's lots that we can learn from cancer. Firstly, understanding basic mechanisms and understanding pathways and targets has led to novel approaches in immunology that is really uh, dramatically changing the outcome. So firstly, understanding the basic biology is very important. Secondly, it takes a long time. Immuno-oncology took a while and now is in its uh, really flourishing. Thirdly, the opportunity for combination therapy. In cancer, we recognize that combination therapy is now the rule, not the exception. And certainly in Huntington disease, combination therapy is likely to hit multiple pathways in an effort to have impact on this disease. And so we will be looking in the, they are platform trials that happened in cancer where placebo was shared. These were managed across multiple arms with placebo shared, the treatment arm uh, uh, going into a therapy as is going on, for example, in ALS, there's the first platform trial now, four arms, placebo shared across four. So you recruit only uh, less uh, a placebo per arm, accelerates recruitment, gets you answers earlier. So I would say there's lots to be learned from other diseases uh, and they bring us hope, hope that in the end, we will be able to have imp impact on some of these uh, uh, terrible outcomes uh, that occur with this disease. Earlier on, you, you also mentioned about you know, the fact that there's you know, lots of different sort of, so people involved in the, sort of, you know, the development of, 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 of new treatments. You know, it requires you know, cross-collaboration. Uh, with the, you know, the in, well, in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, we saw you know, academic researchers, we saw biotechs, we saw pharmaceutical companies, we saw regulators all come together with this sort of, you know, clear focus of you know, finding something to... Uh, sort of, you know, treat and, and, and control, control the pandemic. And I'm just sort of, again, sort of wondering, are there sort of lessons from sort of just the sort of the speed that everything was done? Are there lessons that, again, the sort of the, the neuroscience community could, could learn from that? Well, I take a lot of uh, uh, hope from what happened in the COVID uh, during this period in terms of learnings. Firstly, the regulatory authorities were very responsive to the urgent unmet need and came up with, for example, emergency authorization. Uh, so there was a bar that looked at efficacy, uh, but the bar didn't need the kind of rigor that's always needed because the need was so great. I would think that we will continue to see increased flexibility from the regulatory authorities in terms of hastening potential approval of drugs that truly do demonstrate significant benefit uh, in the interest of patients. That's certainly on the regulatory side. On the patient side and the uh, novel ways of measuring outcomes, we looked at patients who were restricted by virtue of COVID. We looked at other methods to look at outcomes by phone, by video, uh, and the, vi the virtual approach to also looking at outcomes for which we're learning more about is also another way that we believe that even in the face of pandemic, 
the recruitment in trials does not have to be necessarily curtailed or stopped. Then I would say thirdly, the interaction amongst the community. What we saw was uh, one company doing the manufacturing, uh, another company doing the basic science. We saw the interaction between biotech and pharma and between pharma and pharma in terms of manufacturing. And this was also profound. We also saw rapid development. You know, I'm particularly aware of, for example, in antibody and monoclonal antibody therapy, we went from a patient with an, uh, is recovering from COVID to an antibody in clinical development in three months, something that would normally take three to four years. The unmet need was profound. Well, I would say in this particular disease, the unmet need is also so profound. Uh, it's not that it's, uh, patients are suffering, the clouds hang over them, and we also, hopefully there will be an approach that sees also these non-communicable diseases as urgent and needing uh, immediate response with flexibility and speed across all regulatory authorities, mirrored by a collaboration between biotech and pharma and the families around the world. So I'm looking forward to a new era of cooperation and collaboration. It's already there in this field, but I think it can be further enhanced. All right, so we're sort of almost out of time. So I just sort of thought, you know, in, in sort of summing up, uh, you know, whether you get, you know, could sort of share, you know, what, what are the sort of the key milestones that you know, we should all be looking for, you know, um, you know particularly in, in, in the near future that will actually confirm that, you know, progress is being made in, in, in the field of Huntington's disease? Well, I would say we need to learn significantly from the trials that failed. But you know, when there is failure, the challenge, we, they will be failure, but the challenge is how we respond to it, how we pick ourselves up, how we learn deeply uh, and design different trials that give us the opportunity to learn and overcome those obstacles. We will monitor progress. There are numerous other drugs that are in development we should monitor the translation of these into the clinic, the recruitment, the outcomes. Uh, Prolenia has a drug in phase three development that is recruiting very well uh, against a different target, an oral drug. And we look forward to finishing recruitment and being able to see results from that particular study. But this is just one of many. There are early uh, approaches to the science uh, that are illuminating new approaches new approaches to knockdown, including oral drugs, new approaches to dealing with some of the issues, which are delivery, knockdown of the exon one, uh, and, and also improving the, talk, improving the safety and tolerability of these drugs that offer a lot of hope. And then there are just numerous other targets. In the end, we'll probably need combination therapy. And so maintaining a very cooperative, collaborative culture uh, will be uh, very important uh, for this community. And then I would say uh, gauging the commitment and continuing to uh, respectfully engage with the patient community, keeping them close. As I started, we are inextricably bound. Our fate is together and maintaining that respectful togetherness as we move forward will also be key as we pursue new avenues and new opportunities for bringing some hope and optimism and some relief uh, for the patients in these families. So, M Michael, thanks so much for, for, for sharing you know, your thoughts with us today. I mean, the work you're doing is very important both to, to patients and, and, and the people who care for them. And, and I'm sure that after hearing what you, you've actually had to say, uh, they will be more optimistic and will be in a better place to, you know, will all be in a better place to treat Huntington's. So, uh, so on behalf of the, our virtual audience, uh, I'd like to thank you very much. What a pleasure to talk to you, Mike. Thank you so much.
morning and welcome to the Wuji webinar series on rare diseases. I'm Rick Saul of Wuji Aptech and I'll serve as your session leader for panel two, what's changing in the Huntington's disease landscape. Huntington's disease is a genetic and progressive neurodegenerative condition causing cause problems with a person's ability to think, move and function. It ultimately leads to increasing disability and loss of independence. This Devastating hereditary disease profoundly affects entire families for generations. There's not a cure for Huntington's disease, nor are there approved uh, uh, therapies to treat the underlying cause of disease, this condition. The unmet need is immense. In this section of the webinar, we'll discuss the latest understanding of Huntington's disease from the clinical perspective. We'll hear what it's like to live with Huntington's disease, its tolls, and dilemmas from a personal view. We will explore the evolving and growing voice of the patient, uh, of the patient through engagement of patient advocates. And joining me in alphabetical order are Blair Levitt, professor at the Department of Medical Genetics and senior scientist at the Center for Molecular Medicine and Therapeutics at University of British Columbia. Karen E. Anderson, professor of psychiatry and neurology from Georgetown University and director of the Huntington's Care, Huntington's Disease Care Education Research Center. Kristen Powers is an executive producer of the documentary Twitch, and Sven Olaf Olsen is the president of the International Huntington's Association. So I'd like to begin with Blair, and we can provide our, our listening audience with a overview of where we are today in terms of understanding of Huntington's disease and its diagnosis, as well as intervention. Thank you, Richard. Uh, in Huntington's disease, um, because this is a, a monogenic uh, autosomal dominant disorder, it's caused by a single mutation, we have some very real advantages from the point of view of developing therapeutics. We understand the underlying cause, the change in the DNA that is uh, associated with the development of this disorder. And we can uh, determine with a, a great degree of, um, of accuracy uh, who is going to develop this disease both in the well before the onset of symptoms. And we have absolute understanding of the individuals uh, who carry this diagnosis. Um, and so that, gives us a great advantage uh, in the development of therapeutics over other disorders that are multifactorial in their, in their origin. And there's been a wealth of understanding since the gene uh, changes that cause Huntington's disease were identified in uh, 1993. And uh, in addition to understanding that how the gene change leads to changes in the brain and, and symptoms in Huntington's disease, there's a wealth of, of preclinical models in which to test therapeutics. So um, from, from the point of view of diagnosis, we have an absolutely accurate state biomarker. We understand whether a person carries the gene or not. The diagnosis is based on uh, clinical signs and symptoms uh, that are uh, really made uh, currently based on, uh, on an exam from a, a physician. So uh, it's based on the motor manifestations of the disease, although it is a disease that can affect uh, multiple uh, uh, symptom symptoms. It can cause uh, neuropsychiatric manifestations. It can cause cognitive impairment. But really, the diagnosis currently is based on the, the, the development of, uh, of, of the motor symptoms as diagnosed by a physician. So um, there is evolving um, efforts to broaden the diagnosis, to include other aspects. Um, we've There has recently been a move to include a, a, a period that's generally considered to be prodromal Huntington's disease, where there may be subtle changes that don't quite reach the clinical diagnosis. And that's really critical when we talk about interventions and, and therapeutics, because we wanna be able to intervene as, as, as early as possible in the process and actually prevent the onset and prevent that ultimate diagnosis. And there's been a wealth of, uh, of, of effort, uh, originally from EHDN and HSG and the Pharos and PREDICT studies, and then following this, uh, some really excellent deep phenotyping through the various track HD and track on studies that are studying this and, and learning about this prodromal state and how we can measure changes in that period. And uh, I think we are well set up now to bring interventions earlier and earlier in the disease, which I think is 
increasing our likelihood of effect of finding effective therapy. So I would say that it's a very collaborative and progressive uh, research field, uh, both uh, uh, really across the world now, and, and, and have worked well together to uh, work on uh, the details of the diagnosis, understanding the, the prodromal state, and establishing effective study groups for interventions that hopefully will lead to uh, effective therapies in this disorder. Uh, thank you very much for, the, for that overview. Uh, we'll come back and talk about some uh, later around uh, maybe neuro, some neuroprotective approaches potentially and uh, about uh, tackling uh, the symptomology or, or, or onset uh, before, before you display uh, symptoms. So Karen, actually Huntington's disease is far more complex than just this movement disorder and degeneration. Uh, what kind of care do Huntington's patients, Huntington's disease patients need? And are there healthcare providers that are engaged in this process? Uh, and maybe you can touch upon genetic testing and, uh, and respect to the uh, care uh, dilemmas that people face in that regard. Sure. So yes, Huntington's, as, as Blair said, is a very complex disease. We think of it traditionally as a movement disorder with rapid movements called chorea, um, with fixed posturing in the hands or, or the trunk or the legs called dystonia, uh, balance problems, swallowing problems. Um, patients develop difficulty speaking as the disease progresses. Um, so those are, those are sort of the neurological symptoms that, uh, that patients and families experience. The cognitive symptoms uh, can be just as debilitating. Patients can lose their ability to organize information, to plan things. They may have trouble following through on something with multiple steps. So even something like emptying a dishwasher and knowing where to put the particular dishes, if they get interrupted, it's hard for them to go back. Um, they often lose their ability to multitask. Um, and then in addition to cognitive deficits, they develop behavioral symptoms. And this can be really the range of things that we see in the general population. Um, certainly depression and anxiety are very common. Sleep disorders are very common. Um, irritability, suicidal thinking, aggression can all be seen in people with Huntington's. So it's really a, a wide array of symptoms that we see. Um, sometimes we see cognitive changes like early trouble with focus and concentration years before someone has any of the movement symptoms. Uh, sometimes there are behavioral symptoms like very bad depression, severe suicidal thinking years before someone has movements. So it can be complex to understand when the disease really starts clinically in an individual. Um, as Blair said, there is testing available. So an advantage that we have in Huntington's compared to other neurodegenerative diseases is we can send a blood test on any individual and know from the result of that test whether or not that individual is going to develop Huntington's at some point. The difficulty is deciding if it's the right time for someone to test or if they want to test. Um, because knowing that you have the Huntington's gene expansion mutation means at some point you will develop symptoms of the disease. It doesn't tell you exactly when. We're not yet very accurate about predicting for somebody when or what the symptoms will be like or what the exact course of the disease will be like. Um, one of the things about Huntington's is even though it's caused by a single gene mutation, there's a lot of variability in terms of the symptoms that have patients have um, and how the disease progresses. So, um, so it's a simple gene test in some ways, but a really complex decision for the individual and their families. Um, people may decide not to be tested. Um, the majority of people who are at risk actually don't get tested. Some of the reasons uh, that they will cite is because there's not a cure. There aren't treatments at this time to slow down the disease. Perhaps it would add to the burden of anxiety and worry that they would, you know, every time they drop something, they think it might be Huntington's. Mm -hmm. So there are many reasons that people have for not testing. Um, the reasons for testing are to be able to plan for the future, perhaps to plan, you know, family planning um, and to know what's in store for them. 
In terms of care, um, patients who come to Huntington's disease centers, um, like the ones that we have in the US through the um, Huntington's Disease Society of America or the Huntington Society of Canada and EHDN has a network of centers also um, can receive multidisciplinary care. Uh, they could have the access to a physical therapist, a nutritionist, a genetic counselor, certainly neurologists and psychiatrists, um, and perhaps a neuropsychologist to help with uh, understanding the memory changes um, and managing some of the cognitive symptoms. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, Chris, if you, uh, you create a very powerful documentary, self-documentary uh, Twitch, and that documented your personal journey in dealing with your mother's uh, Huntington's disease diagnosis, progression, ultimately her, her passing. Uh, it must have been very emotional for you, for you and your and your family. And maybe you could uh, share with us what some of the key struggles that you and your family dealt with uh, in in uh, uh, in in in, in uh, your personal journey. Uh, maybe you share that with the audience. Sure. So um, again, my name's Kristen. I am the executive producer of Twitch, which was a documentary I made um, when I was thinking about getting tested in high school. So growing up, I felt like um, I didn't really have a community that understood what Huntington's disease meant to my family. Um, as I was coming of age, my mom was already in a nursing home. So people couldn't see you physically. My friends and um, you know their family couldn't see you physically what was happening to her. Um, so it did feel very excluded. The Huntington's Disease Youth Organization had not yet been created. Social media was kind of just coming into existence. So it did feel like a pretty isolating experience. Um, and so with Twitch, I wanted to, to demonstrate to people physically or visually um, what that experience was like. We did not know my mom was at risk of Huntington's. Um, I don't know, my biological grandfather, and he was the one that passed it on. So um, her mood swings and her depression and irritability were really um, surprise, surprising to us. Um, we didn't know where it was coming from. Uh, my dad would often say, you know, when she started showing signs, it, it wasn't the same person that he had married, something had shifted. Um, and it wasn't until she really started to show more of the physical symptoms that she ended up getting tested um, for Huntington's. And so, um, it, you know, it's just generally a very difficult experience. And, and we were kind of fortunate in some ways that she was the only one manifesting symptoms at once. I know many other families who had aunts and uncles, cousins, grandparents, um, you know, perhaps several people at once experiencing the disease. And so we, we were a little different because my aunts and uncles were of a different um, father than my mom. So, um, but yeah, the testing experience, very emotional, making the decision to test very emotional. My family was not always on the same page of, of whether that was a good idea or not. Um, and so I think that's very similar to other Huntington's families that testing can be very controversial and very emotional. Um, and so it, the, the filming process, I really tried to capture that, that tension. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Sven, uh, I mean, you're, you're, patient, you're head of the patient advocate group and to, maybe you could tell the audience uh, what kind of roles the uh, association has been playing, particularly in this uh, physician-patient relationship and how that's changed over time. The most important thing uh, when we are talking about Huntington's uh, and uh, what we really have uh, to have in mind, it is that uh, Huntington's, it doesn't know any borders. And this means that the problems you see people have in uh, US are more or less the same as they have in India or in Pakistan or other places on the globe. So first of all, uh, the International Hunting Association is focused, of course, on the patient, but uh, we are a family organization because HD, Huntington disease, it's not only a personal disease. It affects the whole family and it causes a lot of uh, family problems, uh, which uh, we are focusing on. And uh, uh, of course, as Karen said, it's possible to do something with these problems uh, uh, 
which you see during uh, the time you started to become sick. And we try at our best to give advices, uh, whether the person is living in China, in Japan or in uh, Norway. It doesn't matter. It's more or less the same. The whole family is affected by HD. And, and how, is, how has patient advocacy uh, evolved over, over time? And I, I, I'll, I could start with, uh, with uh, Sven, maybe uh, Blair or, or, uh, or, or Karen can, can chime in too uh, with your thoughts. Yeah, I certainly find that patients are much more involved in the design of clinical trials now than they were many years ago. Um, I think it used to be that we would get together as a group of investigators and experts and create something and then push it out to the patient population and say, come sign up for our clinical trial. Now, pretty much every steering committee, um, every often even safety committees will have patient and family representatives so that the patient voice is really heard much more um, in terms of research development. Yeah, there has been a huge uh, change uh, in the way uh, the pharma, for instance, are working now. Uh, first of all, the pharma, uh, they reach out to uh, the family organizations uh, globally, uh, in fact, uh, and try to learn uh, what is uh, the different problems in the different uh, cultures. And uh, we have, uh, as a family voice, a strong impact on uh, development of drugs. Uh, we are always uh, invited uh, to meetings uh, where uh, the scientific, uh, the scientific uh, world meets. Uh, there are also uh, patients' representatives. Do, uh, are you going to the regulatory agencies? A patient yeah, of course. Yeah. Uh, of course, that's an important work for all the organizations. Uh, to try to uh, to do something towards the EMA, FDA, or other organizations similar to that. Uh, so, of course, we have a, an imp important uh, uh, job to do uh, to, to really, uh, as uh, Blair said, we are in a shift now. We understand uh, more or less uh, the way this uh, disease starts, and uh, there is dozens of companies focusing, pharma companies focusing on uh, developing drugs. And uh, when these drugs are available, it's our job to, uh, to do an impact uh, on FDA, EMA and other organizations uh, like that, of course. Well, thank you. Uh, I have a question for Kristen regarding a, a, a relationship uh, or a partnership between, uh, let's say the patient or patient family with physician. Uh, can, can you comment on that? Sure. Um, so I think when, when my mom was experiencing her symptoms, she lived in Massachusetts and then Connecticut. So she had access to some of the best Huntington's disease support teams in, and I think the world um, through Mass General, through UConn, um, different universities and hospital systems. So, um, you know, I think my, my grandma was the one who's really the advocate for her um, navigating those systems and, and learning as much as she could. She's not a science person um, by any means, but she would try to learn from them what she needed to do. Um, she joined Huntington's disease support groups, which are staffed usually by people, physicians or, or people who work with Huntington's disease patients. Um, and I participated in those as well as I got older. So I think the um, you know, intimacy between Huntington's disease communities and their medical providers is pretty tight knit. As long as you're um, working with someone who knows Huntington's, I've also heard you know people who live maybe perhaps in more rural communities or communities that aren't proximate to um, some of the centers of excellence who may not be receiving the same level of care, understanding of the disease um, in their communities. Um, and then also, I think like with the testing process, you know, I didn't have a long-term relationship with any of the providers that um, guided me through the, the process. I think that is really dependent on the individual sometimes, especially the genetic counseling portion. Um, but I think, you know, getting the input from these professionals and, and having time for conversation and questions and um, really them asking me 
and what I was hoping for from the process is, is important. Again, the, the input from the families and people directly affected. Uh, anyone else like to comment at all? Uh, I would just like to, to add to what everyone has said before, which is, you know, it's, it's, it's really an incredible strength of this community uh, that it is, that we really are very, uh, the scientists, the clinicians, uh, all of the, um, the medical teams working on this are very closely integrated with the, the patient community. We have long-standing relationships. And as, as Van Olaf and Karen have mentioned, this clearly um, has evolved to have a very active patient advocacy role in the design of clinical trials, in, in, in what are important outcome measures that we look at in our clinical trials. But I would say it goes even much deeper than that and that the patient advocacy groups are critical both in supporting some of the basic research that has led to these advances and has led to these therapies and they continue to be involved in supporting the basic research. But the basic researchers in many cases will have, uh, you know, at, our, at, our, at, a, at a meeting that may be purely um, devoted to basic science, will often have patient advocates presenting, especially uh, to, the, to, the, to the scientists who don't see patients, um, about the disease. So it, it, it is very, one of the real strengths is how integrated uh, the patient advocacy and the patients and families are with both the basic science and, and the clinical trials. So we view this as uh, we, we all have a common goal. We're all working together to develop effective therapies and, and importantly, therapies that are beneficial in ways that families need them. And that, that doesn't necessarily mean uh, uh, pharmacologic agents, uh, any intervention that helps patients deal with this devastating disease and families deal with this devastating disease is something that we're interested in, in advancing. Right, thank you. And, and, and along those lines, Blair, uh, you know, we only have drugs that can address, you know, sy symptoms today. Uh, what, what have you been, exper what has been your experiences regarding disease modifying agents and getting those to advance through clinic? That's a great question, Richard. And, and I actually take a step back and say, we don't just have symptomatic therapies. The critical, a, a critical message that we need to, to make more often is that individuals and families who are affected by Huntington's disease need to be seen in, in proper multidisciplinary centers because there are, there are therapies that help. There are approaches that help. And we have networks of centers of excellence across the world now. And Sven Olaf is, is, is instrumental in getting these really truly around the world. But certainly um, there are therapies and they're very effective for many of the symptoms. And that's critical. That's really important and it makes a difference in the life of patients. I have seen it in my lifetime that, that there has been dramatic improvements in the quality of life that we can provide to individuals affected by this disease. That said, the, the, the holy grail for all of us are, is to identify disease modifying therapies. And um, we're at a really... Uh, incredible time right now. Um, there are a number of very exciting therapeutic approaches going forward. We know that the gene that causes this disease produces an abnormal protein called Huntington is the protein. And a very important approach to therapy is to modulate or lower the levels of that abnormal protein. Unlike many diseases, this is believed to primarily cause disease by a toxic gain of function. So this abnormal protein now has new properties that cause it to injure brain cells. And so a very clear and obvious um, therapeutic approach is to low, decrease or lower the amount of that abnormal protein. So what we would call hunting and lowering therapies are already in the clinic and already being tested. And there's a lot of excitement about that. There are other approaches that change how the, the uh, protein, uh, uh, that change modifications of the protein or, or how the, 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 uh, the, the gene may change over time. So there's a wealth of, of therapeutic targets. So that's super exciting. Um, most recently, there have been two very large uh, trials, one large phase three trial and, a, and, a, and a sponsored by Roche and a smaller uh, phase one, uh, 2A trial uh, from WAVE, that have unfortunately stopped um, the dosing and, and, and because of lack of efficacy in both of those trials. So on one hand, we have all of this incredible excitement about 
targets and, and, and therapeutics of these targets moving into the clinic, but we've had a recent bump in the road. So on one hand, we could say, you know, to quote Charles Dickens, it's, it's the worst of times because we've had these two negative trials, but it's actually really the best of times because we do have many, many, many therapeutics in development. We have multiple kicks of the can. And those other two approaches, while the particular trials that were underway didn't show benefit, those approaches still, there's much more information to be gained. Uh, we, we learn from every one of these studies. They were well done studies that are gonna give us information. And scientific medicine is empiric. We learn from, it, when it's done right, we learn from each of these trials and we are getting closer and closer. And while this has been a, a, a setback, a bump in the road, we're still very optimistic that we're on the right road. And we are going to work together with the patient organizations and with our families. And we are gonna reach the end of that road, which would be effective therapies. Uh, Sven, how, how, how did the community uh, take the recent uh, setbacks? As you know, uh, this disease, it, it is in my wife's family. So when I met my wife uh, 30, 35 years ago, uh, then, uh, when we talked about Huntington's, uh, then we were talking about a hope. And the most important word for us uh, when we were really down, it was the word hope. Uh, there is a huge change now in the community because the hope has been going from being something you wish that should come. And now it is much more an expectation. So there is an expectation. There is a strong, strong, strong belief in Blair and his, uh, his uh, research fellows that our expectation, it is that they will find this cure they will find something that will stop the development uh, of the disease. So this is not longer a hope, but it is an expectation. And when you expect something, if you wish something for Christmas and you don't get it, uh, the setback is really, really uh, hard to tackle. Uh, if you have a hope, then okay, uh, this time I didn't succeed, but, uh, and you can live with that. But what we saw during these two uh, trials, which failed, it was that the community, they, they really were hurt by, uh, by uh, this setback. But uh, after a while, the, we, Roche uh, did a lot uh, uh, to meet uh, the patient and the families and the organizations. Uh, we can see that the belief in the future, it is as strong as it was before we had this setback. Because we understand that we, this was necessary, as Blair said, this was necessary to take the next step because we have learned so much from what we have done and uh, where we have contributed with 800 people in Roche uh, trial being participating. It's amazing. And we recruited that uh, in less than one year. It has never, the, the, the scientific world has never seen this. So we are really, we are really willing to, uh, to participate and we are there for the industry again. Now, Kevin, what, uh, what, what were your observations? Uh, what have you seen since uh, over the last, uh, let's say, couple of months in light of all uh, the, uh, the news that have been coming down? Uh, how are you best managing your expectations of your patients? You know, I've, um, I've shared their sorrow and disappointment. I think we were all really excited about both of these efforts. Um, I've, I've tried very hard to communicate to them that these companies did the right thing 
because in research you have to have safety guardrails and when a study starts to go in the direction of not not being safe or not doing what it needs to do you really do need to stop the study for everyone involved um, so I you know I really communicate to them that the studies you know looked out for their participants they made sure that if uh, you know when it looked like the study was not helpful that it was stopped and I think it's important for people to know that there, as Blair said, there will be many, many more studies. There are so many new agents that are coming, um, but in order for us to feel safe as clinicians and for patients and families to feel safe to participate, we have to understand that there is a safety system and it works really well when it needs to. Hmm. Uh, uh, Kristen, do you, I don't know if you want to add any more into this discussion? Most folks here have kind of shared the the general sentiment. Um, you know, for me, I I did undergraduate research with Huntington's, and I kind of have more I think um, realistic expectations of the past pass, passing of science research and like the the different processes involved. I think I've seen it, you know, with my family who don't understand genetics or or the science as much, being very very hopeful, um, and you know the um, and how that changes also decision making. So I think it, like folks have said here, it's really important to be realistic because I have had families say, well, well you know, the science is moving really fast. So there'll be a cure in five years, two years. And, you know, they were saying that when like 15 years ago. Um, and I was a little more like, I don't think it, you know, I think we still can get therapies really quickly. And um, I'm optimistic about that, but I'm also not going to, you know, judge or make decisions on my personal life based on, um, a certain timeline of science passing or moving forward. Um, so I think there's just a combination of, of being realistic and optimistic at the same time um, and using that to guide your decision-making. Well, uh, what do you see is uh, some of those clinical challenge, clinical development challenges? Uh, you know, are the translational models reliable? Do we have the right biomarkers? Uh, do we have the right ability to assess uh, disease status and functional outcome? That, that's another really great question, Richard. And, and, and you know, before we leave the, the conversation on the, the two recent trials, I would like to say, and I do this, people tend to say they were failed trials. These were not failed trials. A failed trial in, in, in clinical development is one that doesn't give an answer. We've learned a lot, and we're gonna learn a lot more as we get more and more of the data analyzed from both of these studies. And we've learned um, from the WAVE study that there wasn't sufficient Huntington lowering in, in those approaches. And that's important to know. And what we know so far from the Roche is it may have been a different problem. It may have been too much total Huntington lowering, but we're gonna learn more. So they, they were both well done trials and they're gonna give us answers and that's important. So I, I have to, in my own mind, remind myself, they're not failed studies because they give us information. The drugs at those doses and those forms of administration didn't provide benefit. And there's a big difference there. There have been failed trials in the past that didn't give clear answers. So as we move forward and we think about what are the translational challenges, as I sort of said, we have a wealth of preclinical reagents and tools and systems. We have many, many different animal models, rodents from a variety of different Huntington's mice, rats, we have mini pigs, we have sheep, we have non-human primates. So we have all of the tools. If you ask me what the single thing that we're really missing right now, unfortunately, what we're missing is a gold standard. We don't yet have a single key therapeutic that we know alters the disease in people. And we could then use to back validate each of these approaches. So that is unfortunate and we all wanna change that as soon as possible, but that's where we are currently. So while we have a wealth of, uh, of, of preclinical translational development tools, we don't yet know which are better or which are best or which predict benefit because we don't yet have anything with proven benefit in, in the patient population. So um, the, the way we have to deal with this moving forward is to get as much of that information as possible to do the best possible preclinical translational work, which is an area where uh, you know a, 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 there's a lot of work going on. Um, but I think um, once we have that first therapy, 
and that first effective therapy and use that as a gold standard, that will make a big difference. And we can then back validate many of our approaches. And I do think ultimately we're going to probably need combination therapies and we're going to get to a point where oncology is where we're looking at different regimens and, the, and, and, and incremental improvements. Uh, but we do kind of need that first, that first effective therapy to really, uh, to, 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 to really uh, start that advancement in a, in a meaningful way and to better understand where we're uh, having difficulty with our translational models. One thing I would say, and this is maybe a bit, um, bit complex, but in many of the translational and preclinical models, in order to see uh, phenotypic effects, we are looking at very large changes in the gene. And this is a trinucleotide repeat disorder. And so in order to see and develop models, we, we amplify it. We have very large repeats or we have a lot of the protein being expressed. And that may overemphasize that element of, of pathology. Whereas in a human, we have a disease that occurs over decades and the repeat size in the gene is quite small, there may be other factors that are more important that aren't well modeled in some of the systems that we're looking at. And uh, a recent area where this is of, of interest is how much role does the, the absence of the normal gene. So we've talked about this as a gain of function, a toxic gain of function of the abnormal protein, but there is also evidence for a loss of the normal function. And we don't really know what to what degree that, that, that plays a role in the pathogenesis. And as we are looking at these disease modifying therapies, especially Huntington lowering therapies, that becomes a really critical point to understand. So I think, again, there's a, 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 an, an incredible group of, of people studying this. Uh, as Sven has said, this is some of the best brains in the world studying this problem and it's a great community and we will get answers. But this is one of the areas where we really don't yet have as much understanding, I think, as we would like. Um, so that, that would be my long-winded answer to your question. So no, no actually, it, it it sets up a question around collabor you know, the question around collaborations, the importance of collaborations, and maybe maybe Karen can address uh, where do you see where do you see the biggest uh, gap right now in terms of uh, the collaborative uh, atmospheres between the various stakeholders in your in your view. I mean, I think the level of collaboration in Huntington's is just spectacular, especially compared to other disease states. So, um, so I think, um, you know, overall, I think the level of cooperation and collaboration has been terrific. Um, to me, the gap is maybe not so much in collaboration, it's more in reaching patients who aren't at centers of excellence and getting them to participate in clinical trials. Um, because we don't know as much about those people. We know that people who don't come into clinics are probably a bit different than the ones who do. Um, their priorities for what should be treated, what symptoms are important may be different. Um, they may have different demographics than the people who end up in clinical trials. Um, so I think, you know, really making an effort to help community physicians, um, community neurologists, psychiatrists, and families who aren't getting care at a center understand the importance of seeking out specialty care if they can and being involved in research so that we really have a good understanding of the range of patients in Huntington's. Thank you. I'm getting a little close to the end. So I'm gonna uh, just wrap up with a couple more questions. I'd like to go to Kristen. Uh, if, you were, if you were to film Twitch today, would you do it differently? And you know how and why? Yeah, I think the only difference um, in filming Twitch I would probably do is uh, kind of like a epilogue, so to speak. So, you know, I think when we when I was receiving genetic counseling and you know when I was thinking about testing, people would would say you know either way you're going to kind of go through an identity crisis um, whether you test positive or negative. And for me, that um, like I, I I understood if I tested positive that that could happen, but I didn't really understand what it would look like if I tested negative, which is what I tested. Um, but I think the you know the six months, the year after the change in kind of identity, you know, I went from being someone who's always at risk to someone who is, you know, quote unquote normal, you know, normal count, normal, uh, no longer kind of like a, almost like a different status within the Huntington's disease community. So um, if I had to do the the film again. You know, either way, I probably would want to 
talk about the longer term experience um, after the test to show kind of what happens um, in someone's thought process and experience a few months later. Uh, Sven, are there, are there uh, lessons learned maybe from other, other advocacy groups that you can bring to bear within, Huntington, within the Huntington's disease community or are, are, you, are you also giving lessons to be learned for those other groups? Uh, I'm not sure if I am. Um, no, this is a question I've never been uh, thinking of, uh, honestly. Um, what I'm thinking of and uh, what I would like to comment it is that uh, the focus from the research part uh, in the way I see it, uh, and I can also see there is a, a change here, uh, it is that mostly they have been focusing on stopping, stop, to stop the disease to develop. So the trials, uh, when we have recruited the uh, patient to the trials, it mostly people being 50, 60 years old, and they have been, uh, they have already developed uh, the disease. What I think will be one of uh, the changes in the future for the researchers. It is to more to think of preventing the disease to uh, escalate. And the big, big challenge for the community, for the HD community, it is to, to motivate young people to participate in trials. Then uh, what I, I said, uh, it was about the Huntingtonus globally. So this disease, it's not a disease uh, you start to develop on Tuesday and then you become sick on Friday. This starts probably the day you are born. So, so this, so this, is, this is really uh, compared to, for instance, uh, heart diseases and other diseases. Uh, the focus uh, in uh, in Huntington's it's uh, it's uh, it's it's a little bit uh, tricky uh, from uh, the family uh, standpoint. And re but there is one thing I really want to underline. Uh, Karen or and Blair they have touched it, and that is the first thing we met as a family organization when Roche said they had to stop the trial. And we got this setback. The first word they said, we will share. Mm -hmm. We will share with the whole community, the researchers, with you, with everybody, all the results we have gained from this trial. And that is unique. I think it's fantastic. And why do we have it in this way? Because we have had a sponsor and we have to be so thankful to for this sponsor because his uh, id it was if i'm going to sponsor sponsor anything it's going to be shared and it's going to be open so the secrets here of course there is uh, there are secrets but the sharing the way we are talking to each other the way we meet each other it's in a way, in the same level, and it's extremely open. I can participate in a scientific uh, conference and uh, sit there and I could uh, take what I want. Okay, thank it's you fantastic. so much. Thank you. Uh, Blair, I wanted, I wanted to ask you and, uh, and, and Karen, uh, before we get to the end, what kind of technologies are out there or, or approaches do you see that can be very useful in, or get you excited about about working in Huntington's, is it uh, is it the prospects of going back to treat you know treating early, for example, with new approaches, or that would either delay or procrastinate the onset, such that uh, you know those with Huntington's disease and the mutation could live maybe a better life longer, uh, things like that, or other kinds of technologies which could directly impact on the disease. So, so Richard, I I, I would say that starting earlier is a real advantage. But really what I'm most excited about right now uh, is that not only is there a wealth of, 
of, of, of, of different approaches in the, in, in the, in the clinic uh, and in the immediate preclinical space. But we now, um, because of advances in um, genome editing, we have the ability to actually target the underlying mutation. So the, the therapies that are currently being tested are, are, are modulating either the protein or the RNA and trying to decrease, but through CRISPR-based or other, other genome editing technologies, we can now target the DNA. And that's, you know, doesn't matter what happens after that. We know that that's where the source of these genet this and many genetic disorders. So I'm very excited about the potential uh, that, that gene editing approaches bring to this and, and other genetic diseases. I think that is uh, ultimately the approach for the future. These would be curative in that a single, uh, once it's corrected, it's corrected for life and it can be done early or late. Um, and really the issue there is, is delivery and how do we deliver these things to the brain? And there's been some incredible advances with non-viral um, approaches. There are now um, um, nano nanomedicine approaches that have allowed uh, gene therapies of, uh, in, in different organs. It can be applied to the brain. Um, it's actually, some of these approaches are what, what have very rapidly allowed us to have um, these new vaccines. So I'm very excited both about non-viral delivery approaches, um, lipid nanoparticles, for example, and genome editing. And I think we're on the, uh, really on the cusp of some exciting new therapies. And that is on top of all of the very exciting therapies that are already in, in, in the clinic. So I'm, I'm very optimistic and I think the, the, these technologies are really gonna change, change the world and change medicine. Thank you. Aaron, would you like to add into that? I, I absolutely agree. Um, you know, Blair, as you said earlier, I think we're probably headed toward multi-drug therapy. So a cocktail of medications. Um, you know, when you think about what HIV was like many years ago and how people died very quickly, and now with multi-drug regimen, people can live much, much longer lives. I think we're going to be headed in that direction. I think in addition to the technologies that uh, Blair mentioned, certainly the, um, the efforts to um, knock down some of the early inflammatory changes in the brain, um, some of the monoclonal antibody treatments could be very promising. Um, and those are terrific because they would work across other diseases. So if we really find that we can decrease early inflammatory changes in the brain, if it's beneficial, it could possibly help Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and other neurodegenerative disease also. No, thank you. We're, we've actually gone over a little bit. So I'd like to uh, have each of you uh, give some thoughts on a, in terms of a wrap up and where, what would be your view of the world of Huntington's disease, say 40 years, 20 years from now? And why don't I, I'm gonna start first with, uh, with Blair because I wanna end with, the, with our patients. Uh, I'll go to Blair first and Karen and then we'll do uh, Kristen and then, and then we'll end with uh, Olaf. So Blair. So Richard, my, my view is that I will no longer or none of us will be treating Huntington's disease because it will be cured in 40 years. That's, that's the case, it will be, uh, the, the gene will be corrected early in, in, in life. As, old, as Sven Olaf said, some of these changes may occur even uh, soon after birth, but we'll have the ability to, 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 to intervene very rapidly, very early and prevent the subsequent development of this disease. And we'll all be working on something else, hopefully aging. Yeah, Karen. I agree. I think that uh, we'll be maybe identifying some cases of Huntington's here and there, but certainly for families where the mutation is known, you know, it'll, we'll have a, a treatment that really does arrest the disease um, and possibly even correct it so that it doesn't progress. And I'll be happy to work in another area. Kristen? That's awesome to hear that y'all think that because I, was, I wasn't sure how, again, or like earlier, how fast the science will move. But, you know, I think living in a world where Huntington's disease is not that death sentence, it's not um, devastating to families. You know, families can hear that they come from a Huntington's disease family and it, it just means it's part of their, their genetics, but it doesn't mean that they're financially bankrupt or that go through the trauma of losing multiple family members or, or and growing up at the same time knowing you may have that same fate. So I think it's um, an opportunity to live a, a life like everyone else. Sven, let me listen with you and your thoughts. I'm very optimistic. I share uh, what Karen and Bear says. 
for sure there will be a drug uh, which we can start uh, to to treat uh, people with uh, in a very uh, maybe days after they are born uh, so uh, hd uh, will probably not be a part of our daily life in the industrial world however and this is really something we should think over it is that maybe it will be a difference if you are born in India, in the street, or you are born in US or in Europe, or you are born in South America. That is the challenge for the world. And that's why we are working so hard uh, to, to bring the community together. And I'm so glad that uh, you, Richard, uh, to, uh, have take the initiative to discuss this HD uh, topic because what we really need it is solidarity. Okay. It's also in HD and in all other uh, cases. Solidarity. Thank you so much for your closing thoughts, Olaf. And I want to give my personal thanks to uh, to Krista and to Olaf, to Karen Blair for your participation in today's webinar. And expressing your thoughts and uh, and and sharing your your experiences with the community here. So again, thank you so much, and and I want to thank our, our viewing audience for taking the time to participate uh, as well and listen to the uh, what, what rare disease webinar series from Muji. And we look forward to the next uh, the next uh, one with you. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Thanks very much. Huntington's disease is one of the most common inherited neurodegenerative disorders, affecting around one in seven and a half thousand individuals. Today, there are around 100,000 diagnosed patients and likely around three times as many carrying the causative mutation in the gene encoding Huntington. This mutation causes production of an aberrant form of the gene, which promotes transcriptional dysregulation, immune activation and neuroinflammation. Earlier in the symposium, we heard Michael Hayden discuss the current status of disease understanding and the translation of that understanding to concepts for therapeutic intervention. We also heard from a panel of relatives, geneticists and neurologists about the patient experience, prospects for improved strategies to address the unmet medical need and how the clinical landscape is developing. In this session, we'll take a look at some of the therapeutic strategies currently being examined for Huntington's. We'll discuss how our understanding of disease pathophysiology is shaping our thinking on different treatment approaches and how these can be achieved. We will also consider how these strategies might be validated clinically. Our guests for this discussion are Ricardo Dolmesh, President of Research and Development at Unicure, Irina Antonijevic, Chief Medical Officer at Triplet Therapeutics, and Amy Jackson, Chief Scientific Officer at Atalanta Therapeutics. I'd like to start with you, Ricardo. Unicure is currently evaluating the safety, tolerability, and efficacy of a microRNA gene therapy for Huntington's. Could you give us an update on the status of this study and tell us a little about the endpoints you're using to assess efficacy in the, in the clinic? Sure, thanks for the question. So uh, we, have, um, we have dosed the first 10 patients in our study. Uh, this, it's a randomized placebo-controlled study. So this actually includes uh, six individuals that got the therapy and four controls. Uh, this is the first cohort uh, that got a lower dose of the gene therapy. Our gene therapy is administered surgically directly into the striatum. It is an AAV5 microRNA that is delivered to the region of the brain that is degenerating. And we are, will be assessing a number of endpoints. So uh, we have a number of biomarker endpoints. Um, these include 
uh, mutant Huntington and the CSF uh, neurofilament light chain. Uh, we will also be using volumetric MRI to see whether we can uh, halt the decrease, the, the loss of volume in uh, those regions of the brain. And then finally, of course, we will be using the United Huntington's Disease Rating Scale to look at uh, the clinical outcomes. Um, and then we have a number of exploratory endpoints, including some quantitative motor, motor endpoints. So that, that's sort of where we are now. We will be enrolling the next 16 patients starting sometime in the second half of this year. Perfect, thanks a lot, Ricardo. So your strategy is to lower the synthesis of both mutant and normal Huntington. Is it fair to say that we're still at the stage of learning where the selective lowering of the mutant form of Huntington offers any advantage? Do the results of the recent Roche and WAVE studies offer any insight into this point? Yeah, so our, our strategy is, is to lower both uh, the, the mutant and, and the wild type. And we believe that uh, we can do this safely and we think that this will be efficacious uh, based on preclinical studies. Um, so in, as, you, as you probably know, uh, preclinically in an adult, it's possible to lower wild type Huntington almost completely and it's still well tolerated. And uh, of course our preclinical studies in, in mice and mini pigs suggest that we can substantially reduce the expression of the, of the mutant. I see, okay, thank you. Turning to you, Irina, at uh, Triplet Therapeutics, you recently presented preclinical data for an antisense oligonucleotide therapy for Huntington's, targeting the DNA damage repair pathway upstream of Huntington. I wonder if you could help us understand the current status of translational models in this disease area and the degree to which such models are helpful in providing confidence in moving forward into your patient studies. Yeah, sure. Thank you very much, Dave. So I would like to start by saying, I think the best model for our approach is really the human genetics. I think the last few years with the GWAS datasets have really firmly established the DDR or the DNA damage response pathway as a genetic modifier. And what is particularly interesting, and I think that's different from mutant HTT is that there is a clear gene dose effect. So we know from human genetic studies that individuals with lower expressing variants of some of those DDR genes show a greater effect on later disease onset and slower disease progression than those with a, a wild type. And also um, individuals who are homozygote for a lower expressing variant show the greatest benefit. So this is really human genetics that has really shed light onto the pathomechanism that is at play in HD. But of interest is also that there are several animal models. I mean, obviously there are many animal models that try to recapitulate HD, which of course is a complex disease. And so probably none of the animal models can do this fully, but um, multiple animal models exist that actually show somatic expansion and so show an effect of a DDR gene, and in particular, we have presented the MSH3 uh, gene as our target. And we know that in animal models, lowering MSH3 has, as we expect in humans, um, an effect on somatic expansion. And again, we can see this in a dose-dependent way. So we know that more lowering has a, a greater impact than less lowering. And on top of the animal models, we also have patient-derived cells that again show in vitro somatic expansion and an impact of, for instance, MSH3 lowering on the continued somatic expansion in vitro. So we think overall that the human genetics data, the animal data, and then the patient-derived cells uh, really paint a strong picture in terms of the mechanism that contributes to, to HD. And what is, I think, also interesting in animal models is that both the human, but the animals show somatic expansion, not everywhere, but in particular areas of the brain. And like in humans, these animal models show somatic expansion starting in the striatum and then ultimately also uh, detectable in the cortex. And this is what we know from postmortem human data is also occurring in the human. So we, we used some of those animal models. We have actually used 
to different animal models and in different animal models at different stages of the disease to show that when we intervene and when we lower uh, MSH3 in our case by about 50%, we actually hold somatic expansion at different stages of the disease. And maybe just to echo that this 50% is, is an important number because we know from, again, heterozygote knockout animals that 50% really does have this impact on somatic expansion. We know from Vanessa Vila's data that there is an impact using CRISPR and we have shown this therapeutically with our ASOs. I see. Well, Ricardo, you've recently published quite a lot of preclinical data as well. How do you put your recent data in the context of previous preclinical data and perhaps uh, how does it impact on your expectations for, from your clinical studies? Yeah, we, we, we've spent, of, of course, many, many years trying to determine whether our gene therapy is going to be efficacious in patients. And so we've moved gradually from mouse models to most recently the mini pig model, which uh, sounds like they're small pigs, but in fact, they're full-size pigs. Uh, and so what we've, what we've shown recently is that our uh, AV gene therapy can reduce uh, Huntington, uh, mutant Huntington by 75% in the striatum, by 50% in cortex, uh, that this results in uh, substantial protection. And um, so I guess we're cautiously optimistic that this will translate into our clinical trial. Um, I guess that's, that's as much as we can really say. We, of course, fully understand that there's no preclinical model that is actually going to predict what happens in a very complex disease in humans. Uh, but we, we, we think that it's, um, it's about as good as you can do preclinically. I think in, in both of your cases, you're to a great degree reliant on the diffusion of your therapeutic entity through, through the brain to get to the right areas. Uh, and maybe, Amy, you can talk a little bit about um, your strategy with bifunctional siRNAs and perhaps whether that offers any advantage in brain penetration and diffusion. Yeah, thank you, Dave. So the, the branched siRNA technology that we are uh, leveraging at Atalanta was discovered in the lab of Anastasia Karova at UMass Medical School. And it essentially consists of two double-stranded siRNAs joined by a chemical linker, each of the siRNAs being fully chemically modified on the two prime position of ribose at each nucleoside position within the molecule. And additionally, each siRNA also is asymmetric in nature, meaning that it has a, a, a single-stranded tail um, at one end of the molecule that is also heavily chemically modified. And what we're finding is that it's the complex interplay between all of these different aspects or components of the molecule that provides really um, fantastic both potency and distribution throughout the central nervous system. Some of the aspects of the molecule that we think can contribute to these very beneficial uh, distribution properties um, include the molecular size of the molecule, which we think is related to prolonged residence time within the CSF. Um, the highly chemically modified nature of the molecules has increased hydrophobicity, which enhances distribution and tissue uptake and retention. And then also uh, the asymmetric nature of the tails, which are heavily phosphorothioate modified enhances protein binding for biodistribution and also the chemical modifications enhance residence time within the risk complex. So what's been published by the Karova lab um, in, a, in a groundbreaking paper in Nature Biotech in 2019 was showing really incredible sustained target knockdown throughout all regions of the brain um, as well as the central, uh, the spinal cord after a single administration of the divalent siRNA. Now that we've brought this uh, modality in house at Atlanta, we have um, already continued to evolve and advance the, the platforms. We've already increased the potency uh, as well as the duration of action. Uh, and we are also um, continuing to see uh, this incredible distribution uh, throughout the CNS, interestingly, in the absence of, of any conjugation strategy. 
Uh, looking forward down the road, there's a potential to leverage uh, conjugation strategies for cell-specific uh, or region-specific distribution of the molecules. But at this point, we're leveraging the inherent uh, biodistribution properties of these molecules for distribution throughout the central nervous system. Got it. Thanks very much, Amy. Now, talking to all of you, there's a, a sense of uh, increased disease understanding and unlocking of new therapeutic strategies, but also diversity in the modes that you're each using to use that therapeutic understanding and patho pathophysiology understanding. I'd like to discuss a little bit what you feel will be the, the next hurdles in further developing not only our disease understanding, but also driving that towards therapeutic benefit. Irina, perhaps you'd like to start. Yeah, I, I think, thank you. I, I think what we all, I think, are saying is that HD is a disease that affects multiple areas in the brain and that brain distribution is, is really important. Uh, and I think we use different approaches towards that, but given that we don't know yet what will work clinically, I think it is good to have actually different approaches that are being uh, explored initially preclinically and then of course also clinically. I mean, we know that it is a very complex disease and, and I think having different approaches, both from the modalities uh, from the target that we are targeting, but then also from the delivery methods, I think is actually great for patients because uh, we might also anticipate that not every patient you know, will respond to the same therapy. We know that there are variability between patients. Uh, and I think really the genetic modified data have uh, really exemplified that. And so I think it's an interesting time and exciting time. And yes, there have been some setbacks, but I also think hopefully we will learn a lot from those setbacks um, to better understand what, what, what didn't work. Yeah, and, and I think maybe delivery is actually one aspect of those. So I think we are trying different approaches and hopefully we will have data in a couple of years from now to be discussing, um, you know, what worked and what maybe has to be improved. Ricardo, would you like to pick up on any of these points? Sure, absolutely. So, so let me add to what Irina just said. I mean, it, look, it takes a community to treat any disease. Uh, Huntington's is a devastating disease. And I think that the more shots we have on goal, the better it will be for everybody, right? We all want the same thing. There are many aspects of the disease we don't really understand. I mean, one of the things that we're struggling with now is trying to see which ones of, which, which of the biomarkers are really predictive uh, and trying to assess what can be measured reproducibly, you know, in these early stage trials. And I think we've learned a lot from the kind of groundbreaking work of um, Ionis and, and Roche. And I expect that uh, the companies that come after us will learn from, you know, whatever we're learning uh, in terms of, you know, how we measure, uh, for example, the volumes, you know, we would like to start using uh, Huntington PET to actually see whether we can actually reduce the amount of Huntington or mutant Huntington in the brain. So all these things are going to just make it more, more viable. Um, it's, it's a journey. It's not the sort of thing that, you know, any single individual or any single company solves. Um, uh, Amy, that uh, begs the obvious question. What do you think are they? key learnings for you to take about, take from the previous studies and from the comments from uh, Irina and Ricardo as you're starting to plan your own preclinical optimization and clinical programs. Yeah, I, 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 do, I do want to reiterate um, what Irina said. I do think this is actually an exciting time um, in the field uh, for Huntington's patients, despite the recent challenges um, in the recent clinical trials, I, I do think we are learning a lot from, from those trials as to what worked and what didn't work. Um, I think some of the key challenges that were approached related to um, aspects such as distribution and potency and tolerability, um, we, we now understand a little bit more about ben benchmarks um, as well as 
uh, potential biomarkers that we can now implement um, early in our you know, drug discovery and drug development processes to, I think, position us positively and favorably for being um, successful in subsequent clinical trials. Fantastic. I'd like to turn a little bit to uh, our broader understanding of neurodegenerative disorders uh, and try and discuss a little bit how that understanding may impact on our thinking on treatment strategies for Huntington's. Do you expect that we may ultimately adopt uh, some form of combination therapy approach, taking into account, you know, particularly for patients that we're meeting for the first time in an advanced state of their disease, or at least a, uh, a state of the disease with um, clinical symptoms? They're already experiencing some degree, at least, of neuroinflammation. Do you anticipate perhaps needing to not only treat regulation of Huntington levels, but also treat the um, neuroinflammation or immunomodulation aspects of the disease? Who would like to start? Uh, I'm happy to start uh, on that one. I, I think that's a really interesting um, idea and concept. I think clearly what we're learning is that Huntington's disease is, is, a, is a complex disease and it's, it's you know, impacted by multiple cell types and multiple biological processes. Um, and there's a lot of variability within the patient population as to the specific, you know, pathobiology that's impacted in their specific disease. So I think an approach in which we're taking a broader therapeutic um, approach to understanding each individual's biology and addressing multiple aspects of the pathology uh, will be ultimately uh, very beneficial to patients. Yeah, I, yeah, I think, yeah. go ahead, Ricardo. Uh, thank you. So, so I, I, I think uh, whether one wants to use combinations or not probably depends on the stage of the disease. I, I think in some ways, you know, in Huntington's, we're fortunate because the genetics are unequivocal. So we, we know for sure that expansion of the Huntington gene causes Huntington's. So in principle, if you can interfere with the expansion of the gene, either by knocking down the gene or preventing its further expansion early on, presumably that will treat the disease. I think what is not so clear is what happens once the disease has started. Because for many neurodegenerative diseases, it seems as if there is an initial trigger that is then that then becomes a kind of self-sustaining kind of inflammatory disease. And so, for example, in, in Alzheimer's, uh, people put a lot of stock behind trying to reduce A beta. The genetics there were very strong as well. So obviously, if you produce a lot of A beta, you will definitely get some kinds of early onset Alzheimer's. But uh, it emerged that if you could, even if you reduce that early stimulus, you still get lots of neurodegeneration. So we're not quite sure what is going to happen in Huntington's. I, I think for all of us, the paradigm is really to intervene as early as possible. And if you're going to intervene later, then we will might need, in fact, combinations that attack different different pathways. Yeah, it's, it's, I, I really very much um, concur with what I've just heard from both Amy and um, Ricardo. I, I really think that having a genetic diagnosis really allows us to intervene early. And this is where I think sporadic Alzheimer's disease has sort of challenges. So I think intervening early and from what we know is that really the, the early, the so-called pre-manifest, I think it's very important to stress that these individuals actually have symptoms. So it is not even a disease where we really start to intervene at an asymptomatic disease stage, but these uh, individuals with pre-manifest disease clearly have biomarker changes. We know that neurofilament light starts to increase probably more than 20 years before the motor manifestation, but volumetric changes in the caudate nucleus and the cutamen start to occur probably 10, 15 years before motor manifestation, full motor manifestation. And in clinical science, the patients report uh, cognitive deficits, behavioral uh, abnormalities. So we know that there is something that has started. And so I think the earlier we can intervene to really hold this um, relentless progression and, and this neurodegeneration, I think the better. And I mean, of course, I don't know, but I think that the 
inflammatory signals that we see, even though when we look at PET data, we know that this also occurs, but it does sort of progress with disease progression. So I think it would be ideal to intervene early and maybe prevent at least much of, for instance, because you asked neuroinflammation, because we really hold the neurodegenerative processes early on. And we know that this can in itself be a trigger to uh, you know, mount an inflammatory response. I see, thanks. In, in some other areas, perhaps most notably in the ALS platform study design, we've seen the implementation of creative clinical development paradigms investigating the efficacy of multiple treatments in an integrated way. Do you think such paradigms have potential in the discovery of new treatment for Huntington's? Ricardo, would you like to say? I, absolutely. I think that you know, there's a lot to be gained for, from, for example, sharing a, uh, a placebo arm. Uh, the fewer patients that you need to not give a therapy to, the better off we are and the better it is for the patient community. I, there's, there's just a lot to be learned. There's a lot to be done also in terms of sort of synthetic control arms where uh, if we collect enough patients and look at their clinical progression, then you can subdivide them into cohorts that look like the patients that you're enrolling in your trial. So I think that can be very powerful. Um, there are some practical issues associated with doing a genuine sort of platform because all of these therapies need to be administered in different ways. So it's very difficult to keep them blinded. So so in, you know, it would be difficult to do a trial the way they, for example, are doing some trials in ALS or the way people are doing trials in Alzheimer's. If it's a pill, then I think you can blind it. If on the other hand, you require is intrathecal administration or intracisterna magna or ICV or surgery, that's going to be tough. But I think there's a lot to be done by sharing the control cohorts. Um, right. Irina. Yeah, I, I mean, definitely, I think sharing control uh, cohorts, and, and this is where I think the Huntington's disease field has really resources that are quite unique. I mean, we have a registry with Enroll HD where we have more than 20,000 individuals and, and data over, in some individuals over many years. So I think that this is uh, really a resource that, that we can utilize and we can have, regardless point, a much smaller maybe still a control group within each trial, but then match it to the uh, existing data, uh, matching to the individuals that have actually been enrolled in the clinical trial. So, so I do think that this is important. In terms of uh, triplets approach specifically, we are really very seriously planning for basket trials because we have a molecule that it's, it's not about multiple compounds in HD, but for us it is the same molecule in multiple indications because it's a mechanism that holds in multiple other indications that we call repeat expansion disorders. And so, so we are contemplating to do a, a basket type trial where we can actually really also leverage particularly the safety and the uh, dose escalation information from one trial for other indications and then for each trial have you know a smaller uh, data set because you create a larger safety database across those different indications and what is interesting in neurodegenerative diseases is also that you can actually even leverage some of the biomarkers um, for instance neurofilament light but even um, imaging uh, is applicable to multiple neurodegenerative diseases, which I think is also quite, quite exciting. And then, of course, in our case, we also have our target engagement biomarker that we can utilize again across multiple indications that, that we think will really benefit, uh, I mean, the patients across a whole spectrum of diseases. Fantastic. Amy, would you like to add anything to that? Uh, I, I concur with with what I've heard. Um, I, I think, you know, especially for, for a disease um, like Huntington's where, where the patient need is, is so enormous and, and currently unmet, um, the better we can design more creative and adaptive clinical trials that actually can, you know, utilize smaller numbers uh, of patients and get these therapeutics um, approved and to a larger number uh, and broader uh, population of patients, um, the better off everybody's going to be. Thanks, everyone. 
Clinical studies today are necessarily focused on symptomatic patients. I wonder what hurdles you think we'll need to overcome before patients at an earlier stage of disease progression might become eligible for treatment once therapies become validated in the clinic. Do we still have a long way to go before we can envisage treating patients at a much earlier stage? Ricardo, would you like to discuss this point a little bit? Sure. I, I think that there are essentially two things that we need to overcome. The, the first one is just the diagnosis, the diagnosis issue. Um, in Huntington specifically, but for many other genetic neurodegenerative diseases, people are reluctant to get diagnosed. There's a lot of stigma. Uh, there is uh, just a lot of reluctance to, to know, especially if there is no treatment. So it's not trivial to uh, ask people to do that uh, when you, what you have is an experimental treatment. So that's, that's sort of one part of it. I mean, the second part of it, of course, is that um, for people to be willing to enroll pre-symptomatically, or if not pre-symptomatically, at least as pre-manifest in terms of motor symptoms, you have to have a really safe therapy that is not a huge burden to administer. And, um, you know, you're, you're asking a lot of people. So it's, if, if the burden of administration is high as it is for, you know, many therapies that we're talking about today, uh, then I think it's going to be important to show at least some efficacy before people are willing to enroll really early. Um, I think for some of the oral agents, it might be possible to do something pre-manifest because I think the burden there is going to be lower. But even there where there's potential side effects and talks, I think people are going to wonder whether they should enroll. Um, yep. That makes good sense. Amy or Irina, would you add anything to that? I mean, I would just want to add that I, I, I really agree that the, the benefit risk profile is, is very important when we consider earlier and earlier stages of the disease. In my experience working with the patient community, because again, the symptoms start early and they're actually impactful. Many patients cannot continue to work as they would like to. Um, they, they have difficulties in their social life. So I think patients, particularly with HD, they know that motor manifestation is kind of like already many years down the road of their disease. So they're actually very keen to have a therapy that that has a potential to really slow or even prevent further progression. But I, I think what is important is that nevertheless, it's not too onerous for them and that there is a good enough safety profile so that they are obviously not suffering from the side effects of, of the therapy. Yeah. So I do think that this is important. And I think what Ricardo said, the stigmatization, I think this is a, 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 something that I think we all should work towards minimizing this because uh, I think hopefully we will one day have multiple therapeutic options for an early and early intervention. And I think we will think that early intervention has the, the greatest potential benefit for, for patients. And so we have to uh, make, make sure that there is no stigmatization, that people have access to genetic testing and that they don't have any negative consequences. Amy? Yeah, agree. The, the cost-benefit ratio has to be in the favor uh, of the patient. I think, you know, we're all working hard to imp developing uh, therapeutics that have improved safety profiles, um, also that are a lower burden for the patient. So that being either different routes of administration or uh, enhancing, for example, potency or duration of action so you can reduce the frequency um, of administration so that it becomes less of a burden, less of a challenge uh, for the patients. And furthermore, um, we do have to demonstrate that these therapeutics are disease modifying. I think that's, that's what's missing right now um, in terms of having molecules that are compelling um, for, for patients, particularly at early stages of the disease to, to be willing to take the perceived risks. Um, if we could actually demonstrate now uh, safe disease modifying approaches to Huntington's, it's gonna be really game changing. You reach at different stages of development and clinical validation of new strategies for Huntington's. I wonder if you could summarize in a few words your view on the outlook for therapeutic invention, intervention for Huntington's over the coming years. Irina, would you like to, to comment? 
Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so um, first of all, I do think that it is uh, an incredible progress that we have seen over the last few years. Uh, I was in the HD field. I started maybe 11 years ago and, you know, there, there was very little opportunity to even have hope. So I think we have multiple different opportunities now. And, and I think this is, this is great. I think what we, um, what is important is to have good clinical trial designs with good outcomes so that we can hopefully as early as possible in the development program and with as few patients as needed, but still enough to really have a conclusive decision and make a decision about what we said, efficacy, but also safety. I think working towards that is very important. A triplet, we take this very seriously. Uh, we are developing additional essays to make sure that we can make this decision on both safety, science for efficacy, as well target engagement to select the right dose to actually be able to make these decisions. Fantastic. Ricardo? Yeah, I, I think that the future is as bright as it has ever been. Uh, I, it's of course been disappointing that the first set of ASO therapies failed. But at the same time, I think we have an understanding of the disease that we just never had before. And, and better than that, actually, we now have genetic therapies that just never, never existed. I mean, just the fact that we can safely deliver uh, gene therapy into the brain that effectively would last you forever, that in itself is a bit of a miracle. And so in principle, we have ways of addressing these genetic diseases that there are uh, RNAIs uh, that are have been modified so that they last a long time. That in itself is a miracle. That there are ASOs that can get to the right part of a brain is is also it's a huge advancement. I mean, from all the years I've been working on on neurodegeneration, um, I, I think I see the the you know the, the most potential for advancement now. Um, so so I think the the future really is bright. Um, and you know the. Look, we're in a clinical trial. We, we will know sometime relatively soon whether this approach works and we have the next generation coming along. You know, we, we will not give up. I mean, none of us here. Amy, Atalanta are coming into this field at uh, an exciting time based on panelists' comments this afternoon. What are you looking forward to achieving over the, next, over the coming years? Yeah, I think I think it's a really exciting time um, in the field. Um, I I also agree. I think the the outlook is, is very positive. Um, we've learned a lot about this really challenging disease. We've we've learned a lot, even very recently, about different variations of Huntington itself that are implicated in the disease. We've we've learned a lot about uh, orthogonal approaches to Huntington. Um, that can come to bear on the disease. Um, we're learning a lot about technology development, um, chemical modification strategies, formulation strategies, um, device strategies um, to getting these molecules delivered to where they need to be um, and to have the right mechanism of action um, to be disease modifying. So I think uh, for a company like Atalanta, sort of just stepping into the field, um, we're, we're really um, fortunate to be standing upon the shoulders of some really um, incredible people who have done some groundbreaking work um, and positioned us, I think, very positively to hopefully really move the field forward. Fantastic. Well, Ricardo, Irina, Amy, it's been a pleasure to talk with you today. Thanks for taking part in this discussion. On behalf of the Huntington's community, thanks for your continued efforts to find ways to improve the lives of patients. We all wish you every success and I look forward to following your, the development of your programs. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you so very much. much, Dave. Thank you. Now, we're coming to the conclusion of today's program. Thank you all for joining us for this very important discussion. And thank you to our speakers for your insights and perspectives. To our audience, we hope you are not only more informed, but also inspired by the HD patients and families who are bravely confronting this devastating disease. And to the scientists and medical professionals, 
who are working tirelessly to find a cure. May this inspiration drive actions in communities worldwide, where global collaboration is driving medical breakthroughs, not only for HD patients, but also the more than 300 million people worldwide living with a rare disease. At the Wuxi Aptak, we firmly believe in a future where every drug can be made and every disease can be treated. That future is only possible if we all work together. <laughs>